Coming up this week on One Detroit, the war of words and litigation between Republican legislators and the governor. Nolan Finley talks with Senator Mike Shirky. I talk with Governor Whitmer. Well, Stephen Henderson has a closer look at how Sinai Grace Hospital is dealing with the number of COVID-19 patients. Then, two futurists on a post-COVID-19 world. What changes are here to stay? And then, Asian Americans in Detroit, connecting incidents of today to the past. I'm Christy McDonald, and One Detroit is coming up. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. And thank you to these supporters. And viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. This week finds us with tension in Lansing. Our emergency orders are still in place, and we're watching other parts of the country who have opened up their economy and seeing what's happening there. For the very latest updates and interviews, just head to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. But we have a full show for you coming up on One Detroit. Stephen Henderson talks with the CEO of Sinai Grace Hospital, Daniel Jackson. They talk about how the hospital has dealt with the high numbers of COVID-19 patients and some complaints from staff. Plus, what does a post-COVID-19 future look like? Futurists Amy Webb and Mark Palatucci on everything from tech to business to education. But we're starting off with tensions in Lansing between Governor Whitmer and Republican legislators. Republicans filed a lawsuit late this week challenging the governor's authority. Nolan Finley talked with Senator Mike Shirky the day before they filed that lawsuit, and I spoke with Governor Whitmer for her response. Here are the two interviews back to back. Let's start by asking you to put in context to define for us the nature of your dispute with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. What is at the root of this disagreement? The root of it starts uh, with the end of the 23 day extension that we provided without conditions. Going back to the beginning, I don't believe when this insidious virus hit our shores that we had enough time nor enough data to do anything but uh, apply the heavy hand of one size fits all force of government. But since then, we've discovered that there are companies and organizations across the state, nation, and the world that are proving every day that they've been learned to live and work with the virus not be fearful of the virus. So we, we went to the end of that first executive order and she asked for a 70 day extension. The legislature authorized a 23 day extension without conditions. And we got to the end of the 23 days and there was still a big gap in between uh, our ability to have even understand how decisions are being made, let alone having a part of the decisions being made. And at that point in time, we decided that enough's enough uh, there's no more extension required, which does not mean that I don't think there should be a, a, a uh, resulting state of emergency in Michigan. It just needs to be more refined and narrowly focused. You're looking for more input and oversight? That's exactly right. We offered to extend a week at a time as long as we can participate in designing and defining what the stay home, stay safe executive order is going forward, providing input to it not being the, the approvers of it. So Mike, it appears that the, the orders are working to flatten the curve. Are you worried that changing course now would lead to a spike? Not at all, because now we have enough data and enough information to, be, to know what to even measure. And if we see things occurring that cause us concern, we ramp up or ramp down uh, the restrictions based on what we've experienced. The conflict appears to be in the two laws, the law from 1976 and the law from 1945. The law 1945 doesn't really mention legislative oversight. The law from 1976 clearly does. Uh, 
The governor originally operated under the 1976 law. Now she appears to be going back and forth between the two, and you've threatened a lawsuit. Are you actually going to court? Without a doubt, we're going to court. When? Uh, it'll be sooner than you expect. But you've also added another layer to this. You've been talking this week about a petition drive to repeal the 1945 law. For the protections of Michigan citizens into the future, the 1945 law must be repealed. It is our firm belief that the 1945 law does not give the power to the governor to rule an entire state on her own as for as long as she likes. Mm -hmm. And we will be asking the courts to affirm our belief very soon. Governor Oetmer, it's good to see you. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with um, some litigation and some threatened litigation um, to some of your emergency orders. Uh, Congressman Paul Mitchell um, just filed uh, litigation saying that uh, your actions have violated his constitutional rights and the separation of powers in the government. What is your response to that? You know, I haven't had a chance to look at the complaint, but the um, summaries that I've heard of it just sound, you know, uh, as though there's not a lot of basis to the claims. So I think every action that we've taken has been driven by the science and the epidemiology and the, frankly, you know, the facts and what we're seeing on the ground. And I believe that we can both protect the public health and be on the right side of people's constitutional rights. And I'm confident every order that I've executed has done exactly that. And there is some skirmishing as well with the Republicans in the legislature. We just talked to Senate Majority Leader uh, Mike Shirky short time ago, um, and he said that it's our firm belief that the 1945 law does not give power to the governor to rule an entire state on her own for as long as she likes, and we will be asking the courts to affirm our belief very soon. Um, what's your response to that? Well, I think it's unfortunate to see politics seep into a public health crisis. I think the most important thing is that we stay focused on what the facts are and what the best science is. I'm not going to get distracted by, you know, all of these political maneuverings. And I'm still going to continue reaching my hand out because I'd love to have some more partnership out of the legislature. There's no question this is a stressful time. It's hard. There are a lot of people who are hurting. Uh, people who've been isolated for a couple of months now, people who have been uh, mourning the loss of their job or worried about whether or not their small business will reopen. And not to mention, a lot of people are mourning the loss of loved ones. COVID-19 is still very present in Michigan. The fact that we've been able to push our curve down means we've saved lives, but the fact of the matter is it could crop back up if we drop all of the hard work and the hard decisions that we've made along the way. We've got to see this through so we avoid that second wave and that's in everyone's best interest in our economic interest and in most critically in our health interest. Um, legislators say that they want to be able to have input in helping you make some of these decisions. How would you characterize your relationship with uh, Republican leadership right now? Well, you know, I think tenuous. I'm, you know, I'm not, I, I'm very clearly listening to what they have to say, but the fact of the matter is we have really reached out often during this process to get input. I've made some, you know, changes to executive orders based on that input. I thought it was helpful and I thought it was good. And so we continue to welcome it. I had a quadrant call that I hosted earlier today and made available Dr. Janae Caldoun to answer questions as well as my chief operating officer and Jeff Donofrio, the head of labor and economic opportunity department. Uh, I am, despite all of the things that are said in the press, I'm continuing to do the hard work of governing and trying to make sure that as often as possible, we stay connected and that I share information with them. I'll always do that. You can find both of those interviews in full on our website at OneDetroitPBS.org. All right, turning now to Sinai Grace Hospital, which has had to handle a staggering number of COVID-19 cases. Stephen Henderson spoke with the CEO, Daniel Jackson, about some concerns there from nursing staff and also concerns over where bodies were being stored. He has the latest now on the situation at Sinai Grace. Was the overwhelming part of this uh, partially about lack of uh, supplies, lack of resources that existed long before this. My experience would be that we were prepared and preparing. However, I think, um, not I think I know, um, we are 
a generation. This is the first pandemic in over a hundred years. And so I don't think that's the type of thing um, that you can fathom. There lessons you learn um, in the midst of, and we're no different than other entities in having learned those lessons. So you had other places that were already drawing resources, whether it be supplies of people, that again, you're trying to pivot and anticipate where that would take place. Um, I think we, like other hospital systems in Detroit, um, experienced that in a fashion that was unpredictable. Um, and so in the moment, you do the best you can and you learn um, as you go. Mm -hmm. And I, I cannot speak highly enough of our uh, practitioners and healthcare providers who had the courage and the dedication to do just that. Yeah. So, so I, I want to ask you about your staff as well. Uh, we've seen and heard lots of stories about nurses and doctors and other staff there and, and what they've experienced uh, during the pandemic. Um, uh, are you worried, I guess, about, about the toll this is taking on that staff, not just uh, physically, but, but the mental strain of, uh, you know, of, of so much treatment, of so much illness and death, all compacted into such a tight time frame? Um, you know, I, I wonder if uh, nurses, for instance, uh, will be able to, to keep doing the job that they're doing at Sinai Grace uh, into the future. We acknowledge the impact, the cumulative effect, mm -hmm. and understand that we put measures in place to try to minimize that. Can you eliminate it? Absolutely not. Um, just the sheer impact of doing this and going through this day after day um, would impact anyone. And so again, I referenced the courage and dedication that the staff members have had. And then we as an organization try to make sure we make every possible step um, and resource available to support them in that. And sometimes that includes saying you need to step away. It is prudent to step away um, so that you can recharge and come back again ready to take care um, of the community. Can you compare uh, the numbers of released patients to the number of, of deaths just so we get a sense of, of what you're dealing with? What I would say is we average um, about two patients a day that come off of the ventilator mm -hmm. uh, that are survivors. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the numbers are over 100 that have come off the, the ventilator since um, the end of March, uh, mm -hmm. which is astounding. Yeah. Um, don't have the exact numbers on um, those patients who have succumbed mm -hmm. um, to COVID-19, um, but, but they are more than you would rather have happen yeah yeah what what should change what could change uh, not just at sinai grace but in the wider health system in the city and in the country as a result of having had to to manage something like this um, as a healthcare system we're still learning as a world we're still learning uh, there are a lot of unknowns about COVID 19 and um, a lot of modeling that's taking place about what's the appropriate protocol to treat, um, what are the long-term effects, what, as we try to find solutions um, to battle this. Uh, I think there's some things that are very important of what we know now. Um, the value of social distancing, we know that now. The value of hand hygiene, we know that now. The idea of trying in communities and beyond to make sure that we make testing available um, so we know the status of those around us and, and the effectiveness of our other efforts um, in that fight on, on COVID. So I think continuing to educate ourselves, um, to be vigilant about those standards and adhering to those standards being compliant um, and um, that dialogue continuing for the good of the community and others. Well, we're all talking about what life will be like in a post-COVID-19 world, what the future will hold. So I caught up with futurist Amy Webb. She's the CEO of the Future of Today Institute and her colleague, Mark Palatucci, for some insight. So, you know, futurists spend equal amounts of time looking backwards and forwards. And, you know, we are in a situation right now that has hallmarks to times before. So you could look at the outbreak of polio. You could look at the outbreak of, um, uh, you know, of smallpox, of Spanish flu. 
Uh, but the, the thing that is different this time around is that our geopolitical map is different, our economic situation is different, and certainly the ways in which we live and work are different than they were before. So it's useful to look back for signals to understand and make sense of what's happening right now. There's no back to normal. I think the phrase that has uh, been so popular is the new normal. Another term uh, that we've all been using is this term post COVID. What will the world look like post COVID? And I think even that term carries kind of a cognitive bias with it, uh, that it, there is some sort of finality and that COVID is uh, sort of isolated in time. Uh, and then we will uh, at, a, at a certain clear point have moved past it. Um, but I think it's important uh, even as we're using that term to realize that the changes that it is bringing about, it, those changes are being brought about while the pandemic is still, uh, you know, quite prevalent. So Amy, some of the corporations and the businesses that you're working with right now in, in looking at what a workplace is going to be like, whether it be different kinds of hours, whether it be only 30% of their workforce being inside of a building, whether people are going to be even meeting in buildings right now, what are the this, this, um, substantial changes that we're going to be seeing in business? Sometimes the best catalyst for innovation is a catastrophic event. There are plenty of uh, companies in the state of Michigan certainly all around the country that are now finding themselves how to manage a, remo a remote workforce of hundreds if not tens of thousands of people. Um, and that doesn't mean that in the future everybody works from home. It does, however, mean that there are probably greater efficiencies, better uh, opportunities for productivity, and uh, a new opportunity to create cross-functional teams. Mark and I usually say, um, if we're thinking about the future, what would it take for X to be Y? What would it take for this future you know, scenario to happen? So in this case, what would it take for us to get back to our physical offices? Um, either we need some kind of digital certification saying that we've either had the virus or we have the antibodies or we've got a vaccine, um, or it's gonna take a significant amount of screening. So if it's the case that in order to go back to work or to an office building or to a stadium to watch a ball game, that we're going to need to use biometric scanning. If that is required, then that means that companies are gonna to have to right now think through what their data governance policies are. That's probably the one thing that every company could do right now to make sure that they are better prepared and their companies are better prepared for the future. Yeah, and how they're gonna be using that information, which brings That's a right. bit of the conversation to tech, Mark, um, and what companies are going to, what are maybe some of the, the future trends in tech that we're gonna be seeing. Well, what's interesting is that Amy and I are obviously tracking a number of trends in tech, regardless of whether there's a pandemic or not. And when something like this comes about, it can sort of accelerate uh, certain trends or dovetail into certain trends um, in a way that is, is really fascinating. One thing that we had flagged for this, this year, for 2020, um, was a, a market emergence in the presence of smart eyewear. This is not something you have to have your hands on and would potentially even change hands multiple times throughout the day. There's so many sectors that I, that I want to ask you both about, like education, talking about sending our kids back to school, or will schools, schools be ready for the fall, and even higher ed, looking at these universities. Amy, can you give us a, an idea there? Um, back to school season sort of happens collectively at the same time. It's probably not going to this year, because again, what would it take for that to be true, for X to be Y? You would need wide-scale testing, you would need confidence, you would need to assure parents that everybody's going to be okay. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to approach education in a more flexible and measured way. This is also, however, going to highlight the indefensible um, disparity in wealth and education that has al always existed in this country, and we're going to see deepen this fall. And I think this is one of those opportunities where if we summon the might of American ingenuity, we can work our ways out of this. But we can't, you know, sort of wait for the future to show up fully formed. We got to start working together on it right now. And finally, what some Asian Americans are experiencing now during COVID-19 connects to memories of fear and violence back in the 80s here in Metro Detroit. Bill Kubota has the story. A few decades ago, some Asians feared coming to the Motor City. They knew about the murder of Vincent Chin. The job is a job. In the television news, you know, you're kind of a peripatetic soul 
go from town to town looking for work. T. Wa Chang grew up in New York. He'd been reporting in Denver. Then he got a job here at Channel 2. But then coming to Detroit, you know, it was at first scary. And uh, I know when I came to Detroit, I think the statute of limitations had passed, but I had a gun in my car. Eventually I stopped doing that because I realized it was illegal in Michigan. But so when I got to the Detroit area, the first week I had dinner with Mrs. Chin. You know how they killed my son? The father hit him. Yes, ma'am. This was the time where Asian Americans were starting to become more visible and you were kind of watching that happen here in the city of Detroit. Well, I think what happened was the Vincent Chin movement galvanized and helped create an Asian American movement or recreate it. There was an Asian American movement against the Vietnam War in 1970, but this was the first time since then that there was an Asian American movement. At the time, there was a, you know, a recession and the auto industry was collapsing because the American cars were not made very well and the Japanese cars were being made better and they were selling better and they blamed the Japanese. They saw Vincent, they thought he was Japanese. So that was what helped create an Asian American movement in uh, 1983 and 84. And of course, you have to credit Helen Zia, Jim Shimora, Roland Huang, Henry Yi, these different people who were very, very uh, active in, in helping fight for Mrs. Chin. In San Francisco, the Stop AAPI Hate Project has been collecting incidents against Asians since the pandemic began. The anger at Asians? Then it was Michigan, now it's everywhere. We launched the center in March, collecting data on news accounts, because that's the only documentation news stories. And so we did content analysis for about a month or two months of news stories. And then we got a flood of responses. When you started getting those responses, what did you think? They're pretty horrific. We're getting you know, yelled at, racial slurs, um, kids and elderly present. So, um, it's actually really wearing reading all these reports, you know, over and over again of how much hate there is. But we're getting it from all over the place. Places that are more dense and, and where people use a lot of public transit, we see a lot more physical assault. So, for example, in New York and San Francisco have twice the rate of physical assault than, let's say, Los Angeles and the national average. People can be more anonymous in big cities. Even in liberal, progressive towns like San Francisco, you still see this hate. Here, incidences reported in Ann Arbor and some other places in that database, a lot of verbal harassment. In Troy, State Representative Padma Kupa has some reports too. Some friends have mentioned to me that they have seen people give them the finger or uh, were spit on them as they've taken walks in their neighborhood. I have a friend who's uh, shared with me, a friend of hers daughter was on a Zoom call the child is seven, and one of her classmates said, I hate the Chinese. They started the coronavirus. It's the Chinese virus. China poisoned our people. President Trump has the courage to call it what it is. The Chinese virus. Kathleen Wall has his back. We've got a long way to go till November, and it sounds like this may really be one of the main campaign points that we're going to hear from here on out. It is. It's, it's, you know, Biden also put out an ad that he's strong on China. Trump praised the Chinese 15 times as the coronavirus spread across the world. So it's both parties. U.S.-China relations is going to be a primary campaign issue. And the more people hear politicians China bashing, don't make the distinction between the Chinese government and the Chinese people. And then people don't make the distinction between Chinese people and Chinese in the U.S. And the fact is, look, if you attack China, this is, just think back to the Vincent Chin time. It's so, so much a parallel, except in a, in a bigger way. It's a parallel because back in 1982, we blamed somebody else for our problems, for our inability to manufacture well. And instead of retooling as we have now, and saying, let's make better cars, and let's say to Japan, listen, you want our business? You gotta set up business here too. Remember the Honda plant in Ohio? Toyota in Kentucky? Attitudes change. Tiwa Chang now covering climate change for the Young Turks. And there's so much oil he suggests industry worldwide needs change for everyone's survival and that we work with the Chinese. We can do the same thing with China. Say, listen, you want our business? Set up more factories here. You know, do more joint ventures here. We're fighting two things, a depression and a virus. We shouldn't be fighting each other.
You can find all of our stories and interviews on our website at OneDetroitPBS.org. All right, we're gonna leave you with some fun video tonight because I think we all need a good laugh. I saw this making the rounds on social media and on the Detroit News website this week. Maybe you've seen it as well, because if you can't laugh at an inflatable T-Rex parade, what can you laugh at? Take a look, from unicorns to minions, the T-Rex walking club is randomly showing up in Ferndale neighborhoods to bring a little fun and levity to staying at home during COVID-19. Yep, people dressed up in inflatable costumes, they all get together and they just, uh, they just march around for some fun. Kids love it. I love it. I mean, come on. It's Baby Shark and a T-Rex. <laughs> Enjoy. I'll see you next week. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. Support for this program provided by W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. And thank you to these supporters. And viewers like you.